the former stand-up comic turned associate pastor of America's largest church turned reality TV star will open up the pages of the book of John Gray. Plus, his team is full of legends and his family full of stars. So I always got him to kind of pick me back up and I, I know it's part of his plan. Hear why Boston Celtic Tyler Zeller says he's playing for someone else. Without Christ, it doesn't mean anything. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, the Washington Post has been known as a liberal rag for years, but a guy named Jeff Bezos, who is a super, super rich billionaire with Amazon and all the stuff he's got, bought the Washington Post. And people thought, well, okay, he's a rich guy. Maybe he'll make it conservative. Instead, it's become a, an, a, uh, an agency uh, to destroy Trump. And the whole thing is attacking Trump. So they uh, contrived uh, from sources that were unnamed a scandal that the president had leaked confidential information. Well, those who were in the room have all said uniformly that the thing didn't happen, that this Washington Post story was nothing but a lie. But nevertheless, um, everybody's jumping on because it was on the Washington Post, and they've got a big, uh, they're, they're tied into the, uh, a network that, that you know, picks up their stories and carries it around the world. But uh, the president has said later, look, I have a perfect right to share uh, information on how to defeat ISIS. And uh, if, if we want to coordinate some efforts to kill terrorism, we have a perfect right to do it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the thing that makes me sick in my stomach is to hear Bob Corker, uh, Senate Foreign Relations Chairman, Republican, coming out and saying Trump's got to get his act together or else. He's under attack from his enemies. They are former Obama administration hacks that are still in the government. And what Trump's got to do is fire these people and get them out of the government. They've taken much too long in filling up those positions. They have five or 6,000 people that they can put in place, and they haven't done it. And who are in there? Former Obama people who are doing everything they can to leak and to hurt Trump. So he's got to clean house. I mean, it's just one of those things. You can't delay it. Of course, he, you talk about foxes in the hen house. They're in there, and they're out to hurt him. And so I would just call on members of Trump's party, please recognize the game and don't be part of the opposition unwillingly. Terry. Well, the president's tweets came after denials about the story from top White House officials, and it's created another major political controversy in Washington. Charlene Aaron has the story. The Trump administration moved quickly to deny the story. I was in the room. It didn't happen. That was the response from National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster about the Washington Post story. The report, which quotes anonymous sources, says that when the president shared that highly classified information with Russian officials at a meeting last week, he put a source of intelligence about ISIS at risk. The Post, citing current and former U.S. officials, says the president shared details about an Islamic State terror threat related to the use of laptop computers on aircraft with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and Russian Ambassador to the U.S. Sergei Kislyak. But McMaster says the story isn't correct. The story that came out tonight, as reported, is false. The president and the foreign minister reviewed a range of common threats to our two countries, including threats to civil aviation. At no time, at no time, were intelligence sources or methods discussed. As president, Mr. Trump has the power to declassify information, so he wouldn't have broken any laws. But the leading Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee is looking into what exactly was shared in that meeting. The controversy comes as the White House has disassociated itself from comments by an administration official who said that the Western Wall is not part of Israel. The Israeli government had requested that Prime Minister Netanyahu go with the president to the Western Wall when Trump goes to Israel, but that a diplomat in Israel told the Israelis that the wall is located in the West Bank, and so it is not a part of Israel. But the White House called those remarks unauthorized and said they don't represent the president's position. 
And here at home, President Trump is set to meet with President Erdogan of Turkey today. The meeting will likely center on the friction between the U.S. and Turkey over the Trump administration's decision to give Syrian Kurdish fighters powerful weapons to fight ISIS. But Turkey is against that move because it considers those Syrian Kurds to be terrorists. Another current sticking point between the two countries, Israel, as President Erdogan opposes the U.S. moving its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, our CBN News White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon is with us now. Uh, Jennifer, uh, who's leaking this stuff up there, do you know? Well, that's the, the million dollar question, right, Pat? Um, we know that uh, the president met with the Russians the day after he fired FBI Director James Comey. So was this someone in the intelligence uh, community with an ax to grind? Um, I know, you know, certainly you don't want to upset the intelligence community because they would have the ability to do things like this. But, um, you know, we really don't know. And this is something that President Trump has to get a handle on, these leaks. Um, you know, this is, this is another case of the administration being pitted against anonymous sources coming out of the White House uh, in the press. This is another tool for Democrats to use against him. And you know Democrats are going to milk this. And it's just so frustrating for President Trump because, Pat, as you know, he has been working diligently over the past 100 plus days to check off uh, his campaign promises. And he has made a lot of progress. Uh, but it seems like, you know, as he's working to do that, he kind of has to take these two steps back every week or so to deal with these scandals. And so I can assure you that, uh, you know, yesterday afternoon and this morning, the president is really uh, working to identify this leak and trying to figure out how to get a handle on this. Jennifer, he has so many uh, appointments available to him, five or 6,000 or whatever. Uh, how many of those have, has he filled? Do you have any idea? Well, um, he, he's, he, I don't have the latest number on that, Pat, but he, um, he's trying to make progress on that. And that's, that's part of the problem is that a lot of these positions aren't filled. And I, you know, I can tell you that, you know, some of these cabinet, um, secretaries that are working with Trump don't feel like they can trust the people in their agencies. Um, you know, I've, 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 a source has told me that directly. And so that's a major problem. I think that Trump really needs to focus on getting his own people into his administration so that, again, trust is so important. I mean, these are high level uh, discussions taking place in the Oval Office, and he needs to feel confident that he can say what he feels like he needs to say at that moment uh, without someone ru running out and, and calling the Washington Post. Uh, and we know that this president, ha he prides himself on being flexible. That's the president that he wants to be. He said that he doesn't want to draw lines in the sand. He doesn't want to uh, broadcast what he's going to do ahead of time. He he wants to have the ability to be flexible when he's meeting with world leaders and when he's uh, crafting policy. So he's got it. He's got to be surrounded by people he trusts. I mean, that's that's just he's got to focus on that. Uh, Jennifer, the uh, you know, I'm going to have the privilege of uh, talking to Michael Oren, the ambassador from Israel uh, on Monday's show. But uh, uh, let me ask you about that Western Wall. I mean, that's one of the holiest places in, in Israel. That's the Wailing Wall. And uh, Somebody in the administration is trying to say that's part of uh, East Jerusalem and doesn't, is not part of Israel. Uh, what about that? That is a, a major uh, issue going into this this foreign trip. It was nice to see the White House immediately pushed back against that. Um, but again, that's kind of kind of sounds like there was a rogue force there in that meeting, Pat. Um, this is a very important trip for the president. His first foreign trip uh, hitting uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Rome. It's kind of the world religion tour, and that again, that is something that that the president did not need going into this trip. Um, he has made it clear that he's a, a very America is a very strong ally of Israel, that we have Israel's back. Um, a very important trip for the president, too, as he decides, you know, the, the, whether or not he's going to move, keep his campaign promise and move the uh, U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, reports indicate that he's getting some pushback from his staff on that. Uh, he has to make that decision this week. So it's a pivotal time for him. And again, doesn't really need these, this controversy going into this trip. But I imagine that once he meets with Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, that he'll be able to smooth that over. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of Americans praying that this is a fruitful trip. Uh, one, well, one last question. Uh, he's got uh, the Turkish Prime Minister or uh, President, whatever he is, Erdogan, 
Uh, and uh, Trump did the wise thing. He's giving some sophisticated weapons to the Kurds to help them fight ISIS. Of course, the Turks don't like that, but that's tough luck. Well, what's going to come out of that, do you think? Yeah. Well, I don't think the president's going to shift his position here. I think the president decided to arm these Kurdish rebels in Syria because he thinks that it's a great opportunity to try to topple ISIS and Raqqa. This is a very important battle. Um, the Turks don't like this because they place uh, the, the Kurdish fighters in Syria and other Kurds in the same basket as the, the terrorist organization PKK. Um, so this is going to be a source of contention uh, when pro uh, President Erdo Erdogan uh, visits the U.S., uh, visits President Trump here today. But look, Pat, you know, this relationship between the U.S. and Turkey has become stormy. Um, I talked to a former member of the Turkish parliament just yesterday who said he is concerned about this relationship. Um, you know, President Erdogan has been uh, transitioning his country into authoritarianism. Um, this is someone who now has control over not only the executive branch, but the legislative and the judicial branches. Um, as he does this, we seen him use religious incitement. He has talked about the West um, uh, on a crusade against the Muslim world. Um, we've seen Christians facing increasing persecution, especially Protestants in that country. And of course, uh, one issue that we're hoping uh, President Trump will bring up today is the unlawful jailing since October of Pastor Andrew Brunson in Turkey. Uh, we're, you know, hoping that he will bring that up because Pat, as you know, Countries that uh, don't, you know, allow their their people to uh, practice religion freely uh, tend to end up being enemies of the U.S. And, and Turkey, of course, is a, an important NATO ally. And so this is a very important meeting at the White House today. Jennifer, thank you so much. Jennifer, we on our White House correspondent. Appreciate that. And ladies and gentlemen, I, as you know, I'm a fan of the Kurds. I think they're wonderful people. And um, I think they deserve their own country. And I think there's a piece of uh, Iraq that is Kurdish, and very important. There's a piece of Syria that's Kurdish, and there's a piece of Turkey that's Kurdish. The Turks probably won't give up their piece, but the other two could be consolidated into a, an independent Turkish stand that we ought, to, we ought to acknowledge and recognize. And that's got to be done, and whether the Turks like it or not. Well, in other news, experts now think they may know who was behind the massive computer attack over the weekend. John Jessup has that. Pat, cybersecurity analysts are pointing the finger at North Korea, and one South Korean cyber expert says more circumstantial evidence puts the blame on the North Korean government. Simon Choi says North Korea is experienced in the world of Bitcoin, and as early as 2013 has been taking it through malicious computer programs. John Babinek of Fidelity Cybersecurity told CBN News' Eric Rosales there's a solid lead in the investigation. He said there is a link. We are really drilling down on what it means, but there is part of the code that is shared between WannaCry and a known DPRK hacking tool. But, Pat, no one has been officially connected. Well, I've said before, we have the best cyber uh, activities in NSA in the world. And I think we ought to turn it loose on North Korea and shut them down. And we can do it. We can shut down everything they're doing if we want, and it's time we exercise that, no longer defensive, let's go offensive. John. Pat, there may be political turbulence right here in Washington, but it's not affecting Wall Street. Stocks are still hitting record highs on both the Standard & Poor's 500 and the NASDAQ Composite. Energy stocks have done well after crude oil prices have bounced back, and technology stocks are still leading the way. In fact, if you go by what's called market capitalization, the five biggest businesses are all technology companies. Apple is number one. Its total stock worth is just over $800 billion. Alphabet, which is Google, is worth over $660 billion. Microsoft is number three at well over $500 billion. Amazon comes in fourth, just over $450 billion. And Facebook rounds the list at number five. It's worth a bit over $430 billion. Pat, it looks like Wall Street considers technology the big growth industry of the future. Well, there's no question about it, but the market, in my opinion, is oversold, and I think there are a number of analysts who think that uh, it's too frothy and that we're in for a serious correction, but the correction sure hadn't happened yet. Terry? Well, coming up, witness prophecy unfolding in the West Bank and see why the laughter of these children signals a pivotal point in history. Well, 
Israel and the world are wondering what President Trump is planning during his visit to the Middle East. Well, uh, will he call for the U.S. Embassy to be moved? Could he present a peace plan? Previous plans have called on Israel to turn over land it won during the Six-Day War in exchange for peace. But that's unacceptable for those who believe God gave that land to the Jewish people as part of their divine inheritance. Our Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Jerusalem. Much of the world calls the playgrounds these children enjoy an obstacle to peace. That's because they're in Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank. Are we witnessing prophecy unfolding right now after the 1967 war? Absolutely. It says yeah. that the sounds of children playing in the streets will be heard once again. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you hear it, you see it. I spoke with former Shiloh Mayor David Rubin in Shiloh, overlooking the road of the patriarchs, the highway Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have traveled on. Rubin told me the Six-Day War was pivotal in Israel's history. It opened the door for Jewish people to redeem the biblical heartland after 2,000 years in exile. Places like Jerusalem, home of two consecutive Jewish temples, Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. Hebron, where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives are buried. And Shiloh, where the tabernacle stood for 369 years. They all came back into Israeli hands. So you see 67, the Six Day War, just like a pivot, a prophetic pivot in, in time and history? Oh, clearly, clearly. It says in the book of Ezekiel, the dry bones being put back together again. Israel was being put back together again as a nation. If we don't have a right to Shiloh, and we don't have a right to Shechem, and we don't have a right to Bethel and Jericho, we definitely don't have a right to Tel Aviv. But not everyone saw the opportunity. It took until 1978 for Shiloh to be established, just above the site where the tabernacle had rested. There were Israelis who were coming here trying to set up tents on the lower hills of Shiloh. And the Israeli prime minister, who was looking over his shoulder at the American president, uh, kept, kept sending in the army to chase them away. Just months after the Six-Day War, Israelis established the first Jewish community in Judea, about 35 miles south of Shiloh at Kifar Etzion. Jews lived there before Israel's independence war in 1948 and were either evacuated or massacred by the Jordanians. When this group of orphans, of those who were murdered, notified the Israeli government that if you don't give us the permit, we will go on without a permit. The government really couldn't stand up against orphans of those who were murdered. And so Kfaretzion was established. Rabbi Eliezer Waldman was one of those who helped establish the next community in ancient Hebron. There was always a Jewish community in Hebron, even, even during the 2,000 years of exile, until 1929, when the Arabs massacred the Jewish community here. A small group of families rented a hotel in Hebron for the Passover Seder. Essentially, they never left. And I believe then almost the entire population of Israel was with us. Even more than a half a year after the Six-Day War, the spirits were high among almost the entire population. Thousands of Israeli pilgrims enter the old city of Jerusalem for solemn religious ceremonies. Which... All of the media was with us. Yeah, I even remember headlines, passages of the prophets hovering in the air. After 50 years, some 430,000 Israelis live in more than 200 communities in Judea and Samaria. The number jumps to 750,000 if Eastern Jerusalem neighborhoods are included. The growth here has been so tremendous. And as we gotten through those 50 years after the Six Day War and we're looking to the future, so we have this vision of a, a booming Shiloh once again. 50 years ago, what would this place have looked like? Barren desert. There was nothing. It was just hills of weeds and thorns. 
This road will lead to a new school for the growing population. There are 8,000 residents in the Shiloh Township. More than 2,000 of them are children who study here in Shiloh. We learned that when Israel is not in the land, that the land lays barren. The land doesn't give its fruit. And now the land of Israel is giving of its fruit because Israel is back. And the most important fruit is what you see right here, all these children here. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Shiloh in Samaria. You know, you read about, quote, settlements. I've been to those cities, I mean, thriving factories, universities, all kinds of learning going on, uh, tremendous commerce and uh, beautiful neighborhoods and roads and so forth. To call these settlements like they're a bunch of tents that you can just move in and take down, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is Israel. This is, this is Judea and Samaria. It's the old part of Israel. And I think it's time the United States recognize it. And listen, these Arab claims are just made up. They're fictional. Sure, there were some Arabs there, but it was, as the man said, it was nothing but rock and wasteland. And uh, I think it was uh, one of our uh, great writers who went through the land. He said he couldn't see anybody travel the whole length. What, it wasn't a soul there, nothing. And all of a sudden, Israel comes in and builds it up. And then the Arabs want to move in and get jobs. You can't blame them. But uh, then they want to move the Israelis out. And the Israelis say, no, it's our land. It's given to us by God Almighty. And I think we need to recognize that. And he that wants to partition my land, there's a curse on them. He partitioned my land. God calls it my land. Terry? Well, CBN has produced a new movie about the Six-Day War, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem, Opens in theaters on May the 23rd for a one-night-only Fathom event. If you'd like tickets, go to inourhands1967.com. You can also check out the latest trailer for the movie. That's also available at inourhands1967.com. Don't miss, miss this. It's a one-night event, but it's something that all of us as believers need to see and understand. Well, up next, the Boston Celtics are on a run for the NBA championship, and center Tyler Zeller feels the heat of the battle. When you're playing 82 games, sometimes you just need a little extra strength. But I always ask God to you know, take over and just play for me. More from the man once dubbed Mr. Basketball after this. Regent University, the executive vice president told me yesterday that the enrollment for fall is up 50% over the previous year. And uh, it shows a lot of people are interested 128 courses, especially when we got cybersecurity, and a whole new series of courses for nursing. If you want to be an RN and get a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, we've got it. You want a Master of Science in Nursing, we've got it. And we, we're going to be offering soon a, a doctorate in nursing so people can lead nursing programs. But it's a tremendous step up for nursing. It's fully accredited. and. Uh, the, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing is a big deal, and we have the cooperation of many hospitals around the area who want to send their nurses to let, get the credentialing they need to move up in their, uh, their careers. So that's just something. But the number's on your screen, or you can look at it. It's 866-910-7615. Regent University and... Uh, enrollment right now for the fall term. And actually, there, you know, but over the year, you can sign in. It's not just six, it's about eight times you can sign up. Every couple of weeks, there's an opportunity. So. Apply for admission, it's yeah. It's exciting. really such a beautiful campus, too. Uh, it's, it's exciting, really... exciting, thrilling, thrilling school. All yes. right. Well, speaking of thrilling and exciting, last night the Boston Celtics closed out an amazing series against the Washington Wizards to advance to the Eastern Conference Finals, where they will next face the defending NBA champions, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Well, our sports reporter Sean Brown spoke with the Celtics center Tyler Zeller about his love for the game and his love for God. The Boston Celtics have won 17 NBA championships. That's more than any other team. And after last night's series win against the Wizards, they're a step closer to another title. And center Tyler Zeller is ready for the challenge. After all, 
He's been surrounded by the game of basketball his entire life. Both of his parents played, his older brother Luke played, and his younger brother Cody is with the Charlotte Hornets. I got a chance to sit down with Tyler to talk about his humble beginnings and how he's using his platform to share his faith with the world. He grew up in Indiana where basketball rules. Tyler, his dad, and his brothers played for hours. I actually wasn't a fan of basketball kind of growing up. Really, I, I got to give my dad a lot of credit. He, he'd get home from work, he'd work a 12-hour day and come home and we'd be sitting there, Dad, you want to go to the gym? You want to go to the gym? <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he'd take us to the gym for you know, anywhere from an hour to three hours. Tyler was named Mr. Basketball his senior year, the state's highest honor for high school players. And as much as his family loved the sport, his parents Steve and Lori taught him and his brothers that the first priority in life isn't basketball. It's faith in Christ, something he's depended on throughout his career. You know, I've been injured, I've had things not go my way, and no matter how tough it gets, I always got him to kind of pick me back up, and I, I know it's a part of his plan. Today, Tyler is battling it out underneath the boards as the Celtics try to bounce their way back to the NBA Finals. And as always, Tyler is leaning on God to help him and his teammates perform at their best. I mean, I, I always love Philippians 4.13. I know it can be referenced in many sure, ways, sure. but, um, you know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And, you know, when you're playing 82 games, sometimes you just need a little extra strength. Um, but my big thing is um, when I go out, I always ask God for help. I always got, ask God you know, take over and just play for me because there's nights I can't do it. There's nights that I can do it, but I can't do it as well as he can for me. And so uh, I know if he's got my back and he's playing for me, then I'm, it's going to work out perfectly. Tyler is grateful that God has given him the privilege of playing professional basketball. But he believes no matter who you are or what you do, Jesus Christ should be a top priority. First of all, should you commit your life to Jesus Christ? Absolutely. It's the best decision I've ever made in my life, uh, hands down. Uh, it gives me purpose in life. It gives me uh, really just reason for being. And, you know, even basketball, it's fun and it's enjoyable, but without Christ, it's, it doesn't mean anything. You know, it's not something I can use for the betterment of his kingdom. It's always wonderful to see somebody who's so accomplished in what yeah. they do give the you glory know, think to the like, Lord. I think Larry Bird was the star up there yeah. so long. For a long and time. And then the, up against the Cavaliers, they've got, of course, that phenomenon who, uh, you know, is so, uh, um, well, in the spotlight in the Cavaliers. But, hey, you know, Stranger on, things on happen, right? Huh? <laughs> Stranger things could happen. Yeah, you never know. Okay. <laughs> Time for some email. I'll Let's bring it on. Ahead. Are you ready? Okay. This first question, Pat, comes from Bernadine, who says, Hi, Pat. Over the past 10 years, I've been turning away from Jesus, and the enemy's been putting negative thoughts into my mind. I want to get to know Jesus again. How do I do this? Please help me. Well, you know, the Bible says, how does a young man uh, cleanse his way? And the answer is by taking heed thereto according to thy word. That's how you get back. The, the word is like a love letter of God to you, and it teaches you about God. Instruction in righteousness, the Bible says. How do you get back? Well, you start by reading the word. <clears throat> and it's an exercise that I would recommend strongly. Get by yourself, take a yellow pad or some writing instrument, and um, sit down and ask God to show you all the things you've done wrong. And you might write several pages. And you get through, you say, now, God, I ask you to forgive me for all these sins, these things I've done. And then you take it, ball it up, set a match to it, burn it up, and say, all right, now let's go forward with the Lord and begin to build your life with Him on the Word, on prayer, between you and Him. And let there be nothing between you and God but an open channel, all right? Okay, this is Madeline Pat, who says, My children were stolen from me by their dad because of child support he did not want to pay. It's been 26 years of being estranged from my children and now my grandchildren. I cannot get over my broken heart, although God has relieved it some. My children refused to have me in their lives as their father turned them against me, even telling one of my children I wanted to abort them, which is not true. What would God want me to do? I feel I've forgiven all involved, but their dislike is still strong. Well, there's nothing you can do except 
just tell them, look, I love you. I'm your mother. Uh, I love you. And uh, I, I've never wanted anything but love for you. And please know, and then just turn them over to the Lord and let the Lord do something. God himself has a miracle. He will bring to those children's recollection. They, there's only one mother they've ever had, and they yearn for you even though they act like they don't. They, they cannot stand the separation that's there. So you pray that the Lord will put in their heart love. In the meantime, you've just got to turn it over to God. Stop holding on to it, because all it's doing is eating you and destroying you. Turn it over. Your husband did a terrible thing and took something precious from you. But God is there. Let him fill your life. All right. Okay, this is Kelly who says, Pat, the Bible says in Psalms 86, 15, that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Yet in Numbers 15, 32 through 36, God told Moses and the congregation to stone a man to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. I've done far worse. Help me understand where the love, mercy, and slow to anger kick in. Well, you know, in the beginning, like in the early days of the church, there was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira who sold some property, gave the money, but acted like they'd given it all, and in truth, they held some back. And it was a deception. They didn't, I mean, Peter said, look, it's yours. You kept it all. It's all yours. Why'd you lie to God? But it was that thing at the beginning. It was like a, a cancer that can spread. That was the way it was in those early days of Israel when God laid down requirements for them and they were breaking his law. Now, God is loving and, and gracious and, of, you know, shows mercy under the 10th generation. But at the same time, those who break his law are going to have to pay for it. He's not going to let you go unpunished. The big punishment fell on Jesus, but if you don't claim that, so that's it, but I, I, God is loving. Just keep that in mind. What else? This is Faith who says, Dear Pat, my name is Faith. I'm 17 years old and want to be a singer for Jesus. I love the Lord and want to use my talent for him, but I need some advice on how to get started and how to get people to know me as a singer. How do I start now at 17? P.S. I love the show. Well, I'm glad you love the show. How do you start? Look, sing in your choir, sing in your church, Sing at coffee houses, find places to sing and use your talent, and then wait for the Lord to show you a way. But ways will open up. If you're really that good, a man's uh, gifts will make a way for him. All right? Gary says, I read the Bible daily and I've read through it many times. Two passages that confuse me are 2 Samuel 24, 1 and 1 Chronicles 21, 1. 2 Samuel says the Lord made David take a census and 1 Chronicles says Satan made David take a census, census. Census. What is your understanding of both of these? I love watching the 700 Club and especially the Bring you know, It On I, segments. I, I want to say that that's one that's been a conundrum for me the longest kind of time. And I've said, look, what's the deal? I don't understand it because <laughs> There was a census taken, you know, when they came out of Egypt, and, uh, you know, God said, count the people, and they counted them. I think the deal here was that David was trying to build himself up as a hotshot king, and it was an aggrandizement of his own prestige, and that's what he was doing. Uh, he, 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 you know, and, and Satan is that stirred up, uh, you know, God against Israel. Satan was using that to destroy Israel, and the penalty was very severe. And David later said, why are you punishing these people? I'm the one that did it. Kill me, you know, punish me. But, you know, I've read it because taking a census, there's nothing wrong with that. Counting the people, we take a census here in the United States every periodically. There's no, there's no sin in that. But in this case, it was to try to look like a hot shot. That's all I can figure. And God was saying, these people are mine. They're my people. And you're acting like they belong to you, and they don't. I think that was the sin. All right? What good questions today. And very yes, good. And thank hard you. Hard to answer. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We thank you for communicating with us. We love to know what you'd like to hear on the program, and we enjoy bringing it on as well. Well, still ahead, he was known as the homeless preacher. Now, he's the star of his own reality TV show. John Gray joins us live later on today's show.
and welcome back to the 700 Club. The U.S. is charging Syria with executing thousands of imprisoned political opponents and burning their bodies in a crematorium to hide the evidence. We now believe that the Syrian regime has installed a crematorium in the Sednaya prison complex, which could dispose of detainees' remains with little evidence. Although the regime's many atrocities are well documented, we believe that the building of a crematorium is an effort to cover up the extent of mass murders taking place in Sednaya prison. The Trump administration says the Syrian government killed up to 50 people a day at that prison complex from 2011 to 2015. The State Department released a photo of the building that was made to support the crematorium. The administration is also holding Russia and Iran accountable for supporting the killings. China could become the biggest Christian nation in the world. That's the finding from Rodney Pennington, who studies church growth for Overseas Missionary Fellowship. He believes that there could be 200 million Chinese believers by the year 2030. He also told the Christian Post that the growing number of believers in China will greatly shape the global church in the years ahead. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Ismail is a young boy who fled the war in Syria with his mother and siblings. They managed to escape just before his father was fatally shot in the back. As Ismail was on his way home from school one day, bombs began falling around him as men with rifles stormed through the streets of Homs, Syria. My son was saved by a shopkeeper who took him in until the fighting moved on. It was a horrible time and I was in constant fear for my children's lives. I knew we had to get out of Syria. Ismail's father arranged for a driver to take Ismail, his mother, and his two siblings into Lebanon. Before he could join them, he was shot in the back and killed. We had a good life. Then the civil war happened and everything was taken from us. Now I have to raise my children alone and try to start over. Ismail's family now lives in a massive camp in the Bekaa Valley with thousands of other refugees. His mother told me she works long hours in a nearby field, making less than $4 a day. Many days as she worked, she thought about how Ismail was being mistreated at the local public school. The teachers hit the children. After everything Ismail had been through, the teachers made it so hard for him that he didn't want to go to the school ever again. Then Heart for Lebanon, which is supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise, invited Ismail to our Hope Center, a school dedicated to providing a safe and loving environment for refugee children. At my old school, the teachers would hit me if I couldn't answer questions right, and all the kids bullied each other. But it's so nice here. I have wonderful friends and the teachers are really kind. At this openly Christian school, along with learning math, English, and music, students are also shown Superbook in Arabic. Jesus teaches us not to lie and to be good to others. I've learned to be like him and to pray to God when I'm in trouble. All the children at the school come from Muslim families, but their parents are happy to see what they're learning in this Christian environment. I don't have a problem with my children learning about Jesus and all his teachings because now there is something different about my children. I can see a change coming from the inside out. They are getting happier every day. Orphans Promise and Heart for Lebanon also provide large portions of food each month to Ismail's family and the other refugees in their camp. I'm so happy to know that there are Christians abroad who are reaching out to Muslims who are suffering and in need. I pray for these people and for God's blessing on them. It means a lot for us to know that they think of us and feel for us. Thank you for the food and for allowing me to go to this school. You know, it's really hard to imagine the hardship that families like this are faced with. Here's a mom in a foreign country raising her children alone. Her husband's been killed. The kids have been exposed to war. And now they live in a tent city. 
I mean, we aren't even talking about all the ramifications of that. But what we're saying to you is 700 Club members, you allowed us to bring the love of Christ and the truth right into the midst of their circumstances. The children are being well educated. They're being loved. They are learning what it means to experience the love of Jesus Christ. And the moms and dads are as well. We say thank you. This is just one outreach that you're a part of when you become a 700 Club member. So we want to say thank you. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. And you are reaching out to people in need all around the world every single day. Pat likes to say the sun never goes down on CBN. Mm -hmm. And that is the truth. It's your gift that makes it all happen. So will you go to your phone and join the 700 Club if you haven't done it already? If you're already a 700 Club member, you can consider some of the other clubs levels. We need you to be a part of this. So link arms with us, link hearts with us, touch the world. Here's our number, toll free, 1-800-700-7000. Call now. And when you do, our gift to you is miracles. This is an amazing DVD. Pat and Scott Ross sat down and talked about God's miracle power. If you need hope in your life, and we all do, this is our gift to you. And we believe it will plant the seeds of that in your heart. Pat? You know, that's a wonderful, and Orphan's Promise is a wonderful organization, wonderful uh, outreach. Well, up next, he's a pastor, he's an author, and he happens to be now the star of his own reality show. John Gray joins us when we come back. an actor, a singer, a comedian, and the associate pastor of the largest church in Texas. But John Gray is also something else. He's number eight out of eight children. Take a look. John Gray is the associate pastor at Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, the largest church in the U.S. John's talent doesn't stop at the pulpit. He's toured with Kirk Franklin, led worship at national conferences, and entertained thousands as a stand-up comic. But growing up, John was unpopular and never imagined he could do any of those things. In his book, I Am Number Eight, John says everyone has a purpose, even if they feel forgotten. His new show, The Book of John Gray, airs on the OWN Network on Saturdays at 10 p.m. He hopes viewers will see how God's love can help you overcome obstacles to reach your destiny. Please welcome to the 700 Club, the author of I Am Number Eight, John Gray. John, it's great to have you here. You know, you weren't actually the eighth of eight children, right. but you talk about David yes. and others in the Bible who were sort of the forgotten ones. What yeah. does it mean to be number eight? The whole idea of the book starts in 1 Samuel 16, uh, where Samuel is at Jesse's house and he's there on assignment to yes. anoint a king. And uh, trying to make the oil flow on seven <laughs> sons and the oil doesn't flow. And Samuel says, are all the young men here? And Jesse says, well, there yet remains the youngest. And there he is outside keeping the sheep. And he says, we will not sit down until he comes. And so Jesse calls for David to come in and he is anointed king of a nation with the dirt of the field still on him. And the power of that scripture resonated with me because David was not even considered an option. His father didn't even know his own son's value. <clears throat> and what was interesting to me is that uh, being the eighth son in a patriarchal society, uh, he was the last on the totem pole. He was the last on the list, but he was first in God's heart. And so you can be overlooked and undervalued by men, but not forgotten by God. And so what the what the book really is about is for people like me who felt maybe marginalized or bullied or or maybe overlooked uh, or were anonymous for large seasons of our lives, that God actually uses anonymity to produce his glory. And what Jesus teaches us, those who uh, identify with this book, is that the process and the humility that, that comes from the process is exactly mm -hmm. what the Spirit of God needs to permeate the earth right now. We need people who have gone through the pain of rejection to be able to identify with other people's pain. Oftentimes when things have been handed to you, it, you have a little less empathy for people who struggle. Sure. But this book is for anybody who's ever felt like 
I know I'm called to something greater, but right now it's not making sense. This book helps to make sense Talk of those areas. Talk a little areas. bit about your own life. You were an only child. Your mm -hmm. relationship with your dad was not what you hoped or wanted or needed it to yeah. be. But your mom was the one oh, who yes. kept calling forth That's right. The My vision. mother was then and is now a phenomenal woman of God. My mother and father divorced when I was probably about four and a half. Mm -hmm. And my father was not a strong part of my life. I saw him four times in my life. But my mother uh, pushed me in the things of God. And she lived a Christ life in front of me. And at seven years old, I knew who Jesus was for myself. And I accepted Christ. And at 13, I knew I was called to ministry. But that didn't diminish the struggle of things. I mean, you no. had a lot of rejection from kids your age, people who didn't understand who you were or value who you Absolutely. were outside your family. How did you deal with that? I think, honestly, you, you cope the best way you can, especially when, when people are making fun of you on the yeah. bus every day. Or, you know, I, I, my mother had to cut corners, so she had to cut my hair. So I didn't get to go to the barber shop. So cool my haircut cut, wasn't yeah. always the best. <laughs> and I used to suck my thumb, so I had buck teeth. <laughs> while I was getting braces. So sometimes I was whistling like, excuse me, excuse me. And so I, I, what, what it did is it actually gave me a, a platform to laugh because laughter does good like a medicine. Yeah. So I started compensating by, by turning that into laughter and godly laughter. My mom always spoke life to me, but it didn't change the pain of being rejected and not really fitting in with the cool crowd. So what advice would you give to people who are watching right now saying, I feel like I'm a number eight in my life? What would you say to them? I would tell them to reference the scripture and look at how, how our Heavenly Father has always done miraculous things with the forgotten ones, mm -hmm. the ones that have been overlooked. Actually, that's kind of his pattern. It is. Yeah. And whether it's the number eight in David or he who was coming from his line, Jesus, yeah. you know, Nazareth, does anything good come out of Nazareth? Born in a stable. You know, yeah. And so here, our Savior, born in a manger, overlooked, undervalued, nobody saw him coming. But of course, he's the Savior of the world. And, and God specializes in taking broken situations and creating value. And so I love my Savior for that. And what the I am number eight represents, eight, of course, biblically means new beginnings. And so God can begin again in your life when you give your life to the Lord and when you decide that trusting him is better than trusting your own intuition mm -hmm. and your own ability. Then you begin to watch God open doors. I've been saying recently, this is the season of the open door, not the knocked door. If you got a knock, that's not it's your not door. <laughs> this is the season of the open door. And for those who are the number eights, the ones who yeah. God is going to bring a new beginning, we are the ones I believe God is positioning to speak life to broken people. Yeah. He's the He's the one that's opening the door. So our job is to stand behind him and trust him for that process. Season of an open door for you too, your own TV show. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. It, that, is that based on your life? It is. It's a docu-series that follows my wife and I and our two children, and it's on the Oprah Winfrey Network. And the, the thing that's interesting about it is that the show isn't just about us. It's about how we connect with people outside the church yeah. and help them walk to places of healing and wholeness. What I told the people as we were going through this process, I said, let me tell you, I'm unapologetically a Christian. I'm going to talk about Jesus. If that's a problem, you don't want me. If you if you don't want me talking about the Lord, then find somebody else. I will not uh, minimize my savior for the purposes of television. Yeah. I serve at the command of my king and they oh, they are willing and have been very gracious. There are clips of my sermons in every episode. And so it's a, it's the intersection of faith and humanity and it's what, what the world needs yeah. for, and, to see. And it's an open door. You can check out John's TV show, The Book of John Gray, Saturday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern on the OWN channel. John's book is called I Am Number Eight. It's great reading. Every one of us needs to read about how God God uses what we least admire or even honor. It's available wherever books are sold. We also have a web exclusive Facebook interview with John. You can watch that by going to facebook.com slash 700 club. Thank you, my friend. Thank Great you to so have much. you here. God Honor bless to be you. Here. Pat? Well, tomorrow, by the way, do you believe demons are real? We've got a woman who was tormented by them tomorrow. Well, we leave you with today's power minute from John. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. For Terry and Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.